Israel and Egypt agree to study the ceasefire plea from UN Secretary General. Courtney this is Gene Shepard on Thursday, October 11, 1973. After a few brief minutes of the news ending, Syria claims to have shot down 93 more Israeli planes in this sixth day of Middle East fighting. President Nixon ponders vice presidential replacement choice at Camp David, Maryland retreat. And that's the latest from the WOR newsroom, Lester Smith reporting over WOR New York and RKO General Station. Next, Gene Shepard, and at midnight, all night with Wingate. <laughs> Uh, I suppose you call them uh, side effects and uh, even uh, an occasional uh, uh, benefit from moving. There really is. I, mean, you know, I hate to admit it. But uh, one of the things is, now, listen, if you want to hear something unusual tonight, uh, just, just hang around there for a minute there. And by the way, I have another story about moving. <laughs> And I, I've been debating about whether to tell us or not, but in the middle of all the moving, moving all kinds of junk, see, uh, this old record, I have a whole pile of old strange records and stuff that I haven't even looked at for a long time. It's all been piled up in boxes and stuff. And uh, listen to this record now. Now, why in the heck would I have a record like this? Don't, I'll, I'll give you the cue. Don't, not yet, Barney. It's okay. For some strange reason, and I have no idea where I got it, why I got it, where it came from. I have a record of a steam locomotive. <laughs> and in fact, it's very interesting record. I want you to listen carefully to this. It really is. It's more than just the sound of an engine. And it's the steam locomotive general. And here's the story. It's a record of uh, the oldest operating steam locomotive in America. This is the oldest uh, train of uh, oldest engine still existing in America. It was built in 1855. That's a long time ago, man. Built in 1855 by Rogers, by Rogers. It was some company named Rogers of Patterson, New Jersey. It was sold to the W and A R R, whatever that is, W and A Railroad, for eight thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars when it was new. Uh, that was the price of the brand new railroad train. And uh, that was in 1855. It's the it's uh, called the type. The type is American 440. It has uh, 440 drivers, 62 inch drivers, 
the length of the locomotive and the tender is 50 feet. And uh, the height of it is from the whistle to the rail. The whistle sticks up on the top, I guess. Two down on the bottom of the rail is 13 feet, 7 and 5 eighths inches. It's a lightweight, loco, and tender. It weighs 64,180 pounds. And uh, it, let's see, what does it say? Working pressure, 125 pounds. Wet steam, no superheater. Valve gear, Stevenson, inside connected. Pistons, 15 inches by 22 inches. And it turns out attractive effort. Curious what kind of traction it gets, 8,500 pounds. It's a lot of traction for an old engine like that. And here's the story on it. It says the 107-year-old, of course, it's older than that now. That's when this record was made. Uh, General is the oldest operating steam locomotive in America. It rolled to fame on the Western and Atlantic Railroad one rainy morning, April 12, 1862, during the Civil War, when James J. Andrews and 19 Yankee Raiders made off with it at Big Shanty, Georgia. Georgia, Big Shanty, Georgia, and headed towards Chattanooga, Tennessee. They stole it. Did you, did you ever hear that story? It's a fantastic story. In fact, this has been made into a couple of movies. It was one of the most uh, famous stories of the Civil War with these, these uh, raiders, uh, a raider led by a guy named James Andrews, and 19 raiders leaped out of the darkness. They were like early commandos, and this train, this engine, was working for the South at the time. It was owned by the South, and they grabbed the railroad train, and they took off with it in the darkness. And, of course, the uh, Confederate soldiers and everybody else pursued them, and the ensuing 87-mile chase, they had to stop for wood, chop down wood, because it burnt wood, you know, uh, by William A. Fuller, conductor of the train. The train conductor got mad and chased them. He was a Southerner, of course. And his uh, ultimate capture of the engine, eight hours later, became one of the best remembered highlights of that conflict and today the historic this is all on the liner notes the historic locomotive reconditioned by the louisville and nashville railroad uh they now are the lessee of the old railroad that owned it originally they've uh, they've restored it and uh and it actually runs and they run this thing and if you want to hear the sound of this thing uh, it's kind of a miracle, it says. In fact, it says that the fact that it's in existence is sort of a miracle. It was wrecked the night of August 31st, 1864, when the city of Atlanta fell before the onslaught of the Union Army. The ammunition train it headed was dynamited to prevent capture. Rebuilt in 1871, the general was in service until 1886. Rescued from the scrap heap in 1891 by a history-minded railroader, it was restored as a relic of the war and placed on exhibit in Union Station, Chattanooga, Tennessee. There it remained for the next 70 years, except for short absences when it was taken to the World's Fairs and all that kind of stuff. And uh, now they've reconditioned it again, and it ran for the first time in many, many years under its own steam. In fact, the first time in over 50 years. Uh, in fact, uh, when they were reconditioning it, the guys who were taking you find this interesting, Barney? When they were taking it apart, it's a fantastic, 100-year-old engine. It says they discovered it was in almost perfect state of preservation. Even the boiler could safely withstand its rated pressure of 150 pounds. That's how well it was built originally. Fantastic. The original wood lagging, which was the insulation in the thing, was in such good condition that they simply reused it. They didn't even uh, replace it. Uh, the only parts that they needed were a few pipes like flues, which are incidentally replaced anyway every five years. They carry the heat, see. Uh, they, they put in a new uh, axle. One axle was out of line. And they put in air brakes to conform with modern regulations. So uh, the, thing, uh, uh, the thing is run. You want to hear what sounds now? Uh, who did it? Is that what you want to know, Barney? Where was it done? Well, uh... Let's see, it was done in the uh, Louisville and Nashville uh, train uh, sheds at Louisville. In other words, they have a big reconditioning place there where they recondition the regular trains, and they did this job. Fantastic job. Uh, one of the general's hydraulic water pumps was disconnected, and, uh, and they put it all back together. On April 4th, 14th, 1962, with over 50,000 people watching, 
The general made a rerun along the same stretch of railroad over which it sped that fateful night over a hundred years ago in the chase that made it famous. It's fascinating that the rails still exist. And so now they recorded the sound of this actual train. It says on this record are uh, the rare and exciting sounds of this little steam locomotive, just exactly as it sounded between 1855 and 1886 as it rolled along the tracks of the W and A Railroad in North Georgia. Now listen carefully, this is the way a real ancient, a genuine ancient, the oldest train existing in America, built in 1855, sounds. Listen to the sound, bring it in quiet. That's a great sound. Yeah. That's a strange sound. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> Yeah, I'll bet the engine is in better shape than the record. All right. There she goes. Yeah, that's more normal. Listen to this. That's a great sounding little engine. That's the General. One hundred and some odd years old. Built in 1855. Hear that tappets? Little steam uh, escape valve there. Got a bell, yeah. Here's a picture of it. Beautiful little thing. I wonder where it is, anyway. This is, by the way, the only authorized record of the actual sounds of the general. It was issued by the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. This record. Yeah. There's her whistle. Oh, I can't do uh, it. A fantastic sound. I never heard this record. This has been uh, amid all the pile of junk in my office all the time. I don't know where I got it. No idea. Now, this was made on the famous run that it made. Uh, you know, this is, uh, it ran between... I love that whistle. I wonder how fast she goes. I suppose it depends on the load. Sounds like she's moving. Here's a picture in color of her doing this trip, running through uh, Union Springs, Georgia. See it? Great sound. Uh, what, what's the other cut on that side, Barney? I'm just curious. That's terrific. <laughs> and here is a picture that was taken. Uh, uh, this uh, this thing also includes some pictures. And it was taken, uh, this picture was taken after the demolition of the uh, ammunition train, August 31st, 1864. And uh, you can see the train all wrecked in the background. It was a very early uh, tin-type photograph. And here's the engine sitting there, looking just exactly the way it looks in the picture in the front, where it's been restored. And uh, there's also a picture. It was, it was shown in the Union Station, exhibited in Chattanooga for 70 years, this train. Probably some people listening even saw it. This is the bell. That's the sound of the bell. Uh, that's the bell of the general. That's the actual bell, too, it said here. It says, uh, the only thing they've replaced that weren't uh, original are the brake drums, stuff like that. And uh, the actual working stuff of it is uh, is real. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, the whistle, by the way, is is a uh, is an acorn design. It's a little acorn. It looks like an acorn. Uh, the whistle, it says, is the very elegant, uh, fine proportioned example of the acorn design. Whistle. <laughs> it does look like an acorn. See it sitting up there? That's the whistle. And uh, all the engineers are standing around looking at it. They're fascinated. What's this cut sound like? Let's hear this one. Yeah, this is the general going through a tunnel. Listen to it. Wow. What a great sound. It sounds, like, it sounds like a real big engine, doesn't it? Wow.
That's right. Switch. Yeah. Oh, listen to her. Now she's going up a grade. Remember that poem when you were a kid? I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> the little engine that could. Yeah, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. Well, oh, what a great sound. I'm glad we found that record. That's that's really great. That's a, a 19, uh, or rather an 1855 locomotive, the General. He's been in more movies. I don't know whether they used the real uh, engine in the movies, because they actually did it. I think, didn't Disney do a film of that thing? This is WOR New York, and uh, this is an RKO General Station. If you want to find something out, you've got to ask tough questions. And we want to find something out. Do you know you're probably drinking the wrong beer? Do you know there's a beer so good some people won't drink any other kind? Do you know this great beer's name is Ballantine? Does that surprise you? Why not try a Ballantine today? We can ask tough questions about beer because we've got the answer. The only answer, Ballantine. Oh yes, of course, brewed by P. Ballantine Brewing Company of picturesque Cranston, Rhode Island, naturally. Whirlpool Corporation is the world's largest manufacturer of home appliances. And when there's a sale of Whirlpool appliances, you'd better believe you can save money. Save big money on finest quality washers, dryers, refrigerators, dishwashers. Right now at your Whirlpool dealers, you can save $50 on a super capacity 18 pound washer that has three different washing speeds and six separate cycles. The finest quality washer Whirlpool makes now at a $50 savings to you. And there's a $50 savings on the matching gas or electric dryer. Or if you need a refrigerator or a dishwasher, think Whirlpool, and you will save $50 on these quality products. Yes, if you're interested in saving money, and who isn't, visit your Whirlpool dealer and save $50 while the quantities last. And more important, you get Whirlpool quality. This is Marty Glickman with this week's Jets Biz. This Sunday afternoon, the New York Jets go against the New England Patriots right here over WOR Radio. Won't you join me and former Jet captain Larry Grantham for all the live action from Schaefer Stadium in Foxborough at 1235. That's this Sunday afternoon at 1235. After all, who needs TV when you have Glickman and Grantham? Uh, are there any other cuts on that... Uh... Uh, this thing before we throw the thrown this thing out with the rest of the junk. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautifully recorded thing. Actually, uh, here's a little more information on it. I hope I'm not boring you. This is this boring to you? This thing, I don't. Not, it isn't to me. Uh, let's see. Uh, you know, sounds. You know what I think? I think about sounds. Fascinating thing. Hold it there for a minute, uh, Barney, if you will. I think sounds, uh, in some ways, are more effective than the actual sight of a thing. It's funny. Uh, it, it really is, because uh, I, uh, listening to this locomotive here, you know, you'd look at the thing, see, and, and it would be great looking, I'm sure, if you saw it in, the, in, the, in a museum or something. But the sound of it going, it, it really sounds alive. You know, uh, that brings up a whole, uh, a whole thing that, uh, that uh, is hardly ever talked about, and that is that the that the artwork of our time, this is the 20th century, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to tell you. <laughs> and, and I think that, that what is uh, happening, we, we've been slowly going into another era, of course, for oh, probably uh, half a century now or more. But, uh, but all the, the great machinery uh, that was created by man uh, back in the 19th century uh, up through the 20th century, up through about 1950, something like that. A lot of this stuff is just sitting around, unused. It's it's not used anymore, and it's slowly being chopped up for scrap and so on. And yet, 150, 200 years from now, those pieces of machinery, which we just call junk, 
would be great museum exhibits of the future, really. Because machinery, of course, changed the world. There's no question about it. I mean, machinery is what made the modern world. And the nature of machinery has changed in the, the past 50 years. Um, machinery has become largely miniaturized. It's become electronic more than uh, physical. And it's changed drastically. But back in the, in the days of the 19th century, you know, when, when machines were really mechanical things, you know, they were fantastic machines, real marvels, I mean, genuine marvels. It's hard to believe it. I saw, for example, just the other day, of course, England is more aware of this than America. Uh, the English are more historical-minded than we are. They have always been. And, uh, of course, they have more history to be historical-minded about, of course. Uh, naturally, uh, thousands of years have gone by on that island, and uh, the Roman ruins are still being found and so forth. But they are much more interested in contemporary history than we are. As a matter of fact, uh, when I was in England last, uh, Germany is this way too. A lot of the European countries is a fantastic museum in Munich. If you ever get to Munich, go to see it. It's the Museum of Technique. And it's world famous, and it is really worth a visit. Uh, it's, a, it's a museum where you might say all the stuff of the 19th century and the 20th century are on display there, uh, the actual things, and they've been restored. For example, uh, okay, so that it goes back before the 19th century. For example, they have some of the very earliest uh, 17th and 18th century first attempts at building steam engines and they're there they're actually there these are not models they're the real thing uh, they have they have an, an entire section this is fantastic section filled with uh, with musical instruments that have ceased to be in existence and that were tried once briefly and this guy plays them for you he really does there's a guy that can play all this stuff and he takes you around and he sits down and he plays uh, Bach fugues for example on a, on a, on a weird-looking bellows-operated steam pipe organ. Sounds wild. And he plays this stuff. He says this was in the, he tells you where it was. It was in Cologne for a hundred years or something like that. And it's a fantastic museum. In fact, there's an interesting story about that museum. I don't want to tell you this, but, but it, see, these people recognize the fact that people will come after us Americans rarely concern themselves with posterity. We, we don't think in terms, I guess because maybe we're afraid of death, all kinds of things in our private lives. We don't want to concede that 300 years is going to be, go by, and we'll be just vague memories. If that, we'll be gone completely. And the people of that period, three, four hundred years from now, are going to want to know about our time. They really are, you know, just like we want to know about how life must have been during the Civil War. We want to know about these things. And they'll have the same urge about us. And very little of our things, the real things, the genuine things that changed our world are being preserved. We preserve artworks. Well, you know, art is beautiful and so, but it doesn't necessarily uh, have much historical meaning, really. Uh, so the, the, the Germans and also the English are, are much more aware of this. I, don't, I can't speak for the French, but I do know that the, the fantastic museums in Germany like this. And certainly there's one in England that's spectacular. I, I find another thing that England does. England preserves uh, the early things in its country, like, for example, an early factory at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, back in the early 19th century. They, were, they, they have preserved whole factories, the whole thing. You can go and see it, just how it was in the very beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. And, and you know, it might have been a machine to make cloth or something, see? And you see all this fantastic machinery with all kinds of rods and pipes, and it's driven by a gigantic wheel <laughs> that goes out into the water someplace, and it's water-driven, you know, and you can see the seats where the people sat and worked on this thing, and I think it's just really something. We, ne we never do that in our country, rarely. It's, we're beginning to now. Uh, I, I uh, well, I, I saw, now this is uh, just a personal observation, 
uh, up in the New England area, of course, which is the oldest section of our country. This is where, where really where you'd see more of this stuff in actual existence because, well, we've been up in New England uh, since, uh, well, since the 1600s. We've been building things and so on. And now archaeologists are beginning to really start to, uh, to, to dig up there in, in the archaeological sense rather than uh, the historical sense. They're really digging as if they're digging among the ruins of early man. And they're finding fascinating things. And I, I, I in my own personal experiences, I remember uh, when I first went up to Maine, I used to go up to Maine all the time, and I still do. And I, I remember when I first went up to Maine, though, which was sometime in the mid-50s, uh, there was this town, it doesn't matter, I won't even mention the name of the town, but I remember going through this town, and, uh, and uh, there's a river that runs right through it, one of the big rivers of Maine, and of course, uh, one of the reasons why there was so many mills and stuff up in New England was because there was a lot of water power up there. Some of the great rivers flew up, you know, th uh, fl uh, flowed through these areas, fast water, uh, places like the Kennebec and the Androscoggin, uh, a lot of these great rivers that flowed through Penobscot and all that. Well, anyway, there was a factory there, see. And it was on the side of this river right there in the middle of town. And it was made out of red brick. And it was boarded up. And it was about uh, three or four stories. And it was sitting right down on the water. Well, that night, uh, when, I, when I got into town there, I... I one of those great nights, you know, some, sometimes you do things that, that you remember all your life, and this it happens to have been one of those things. Yeah, I, you know, it was nothing that I did to, that was necessarily uh, conscious. It just sort of happened, and I, I it was kind of chilly that night. It was late in, uh, in November. I think it was very cold up in Maine at that time. It was kind of chilly, and the wind was blowing. And I uh, got out of the car, and I was with somebody else, and we wanted something to eat, and everything was closed. The only thing that was open there was this pizza joint. So I went into this joint and got, and you couldn't eat it in there. So you, had to, you had to eat it out. It was just a place where pizzas to go. So we got a couple of pizzas and a couple of cans of beer and came back out into the night and walked down the main street of this town. It was absolutely closed up for the night. It was uh, no tourist season, 11 o'clock at night. It was a late, a late night for that area. And walked down towards the river. You could hear the river at night going through the town, and you, you still can in that town. It's a beautiful river, and you could hear this river just rolling out. It was the Kennebec River. And just You could hear the ripple of the water just going, and just a steady uh, murmur is what it really was. And we walked down by the bridge that went over the river and looked down. You could see this fast water, absolutely pitch black, flowing on, great ripples, and there was a heavy moon, a big moon. It was about a three-quarter moon shining down. And this cold water was gleaming in the moon. Well, off to our right was this old factory standing there, just absolutely silent and black. And it had this huge water wheel that came out of the side of it and down into the water. It wasn't running, of course, any longer. And there were locks there, ancient locks. Now, these locks, uh, I later found out, were built in the late 1700s. <laughs> yeah, the late 1700s. Can you imagine that? Like 1780, something like that. Right after the Revolutionary War. And there were, there were big iron locks just standing there with these huge iron wheels with these sort of curving spokes. And they were hand-operated. You could see where guys had grabbed these big wheels and turned them. And the, the locks went down and then uh, they'd turn them to allow boats or something to go through in the locks. But here were these big gears and all that, all standing at night. And we, we got out, uh, out on a little jetty and sat down on the locks and drank our beer and ate our, ate our pizzas in the night there with the water flowing by. And this old, old factory standing over us, red brick. And you could see these little windows going up the side of it. And they were those kind of windows, you know, they're very flat with a white curving stone top to them. You know, that curving type, narrow little windows. They looked like, almost like the kind you'd shoot arrows out of, you know. <laughs> but there it was standing. So I thought, gee, that's a beautiful thing. And it really is. And uh, it was just a, a great thing. Well, the next day, I'm walking down in the town, and I, 
I went into the uh, into the gas station there. I was, my car was getting greased, and, and uh, I got talking to the gas station guy, and I said, hey, what is that factory down there? He said, oh, you mean the, the old one down there by the bridge? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, that thing's been shut. He says, probably been shut for 50, 60 years. It's been shut for a long time, probably 100 years. I said, well, what is it? He said, well, it's an old mill. They used to make cloth there or something. He said, I think it was cloth. And I said, well, when was it built? Oh, he says, this, uh, that, that place is probably like uh, 1800 or something like that, probably 1780, something like that. I said, you mean that factory's been sitting down there all that time? Oh, he says, that old junk. He said, that's a pile of junk. He said, they're, they're going to probably clean that out when the, when the urban renewal takes over. And uh, I said, you mean they're going to they're gonna chop that down? He said, oh, what do you mean? He said, it's just nothing but a pile of old bricks down there. What the hell, you know? He thought that was a great thing, that they were going to move all that stuff out. Well, that building was there for two years. I remember seeing it. Uh, I'd go up there and hear through, this, through that, something absolutely untouched. And then one summer I went up there, and sure enough, nothing. What do you think is there now on the site? Do I have to tell you? A shopping center. <laughs> And that beautiful building, which, which should have been restored and which was standing there practically intact, was probably sold off for junk. The bricks uh, just chopped up, and that was the end of it. And uh, that would never have happened in, in England. I, I suspect in a few years that kind of thing won't happen again. You know, people are, are much more aware of that sort of thing, although they're still doing it. Uh, I, I uh, saw this beautiful place. Now, you know, speaking of museums, uh, and, and that Munich, Munich Museum. There's an interesting story about that one. Uh, I don't know how I got on the subject, but <laughs> it's an interesting one. One that you don't hear much about, you know? Uh, that, that is that the, the, the machinery that we live with uh, as, as museum objects. Do you know that a, that a concrete mixer, for example, and you've seen concrete mixers many times with that thing going around, you know, the big yellow machine with the motor roaring. Well, uh, what with the new types of materials that are coming into use throughout the country, the prefab uh, slab buildings and all that, the concrete mixer is very rapidly going the way of the spinning wheel. Did you know that? That's right. And that, uh, that a few years from now, a concrete mixer, an actual concrete mixer, will be a real objet d'art, a genuine objet d'art, I'm telling you. Well, you know, I, speaking of Maine, uh, and, and that kind of thing. The other day, I was, uh, this was a couple of weeks ago, I was up on a farm in Maine. Uh, again, this is way off the, the tourist path of Maine. This is deep inland in Maine. I couldn't believe what I saw there. It was, it was a big farm, great big farm, and a tremendous, tremendous farm. And it was, a, it was an old farm. It had been there like most of the New England farms. It had been there many, many, many years, probably centuries. And uh, he had a barn. And this barn was uh, huge, and it was, it was just like a giant rabbit warren. It was piled inside with hay all the way to the top, and these ancient beams. And I said, well, I, I was talking to the farmer. I said, this fantastic barn. It was made of this weathered old gray wood, and you could smell uh, the harnesses and all this stuff. And he had a lot of horses there, see. So I was in the barn with him, and he said, yeah, he says, this is some barn. I said, when was it built? He says, well, the earliest record of this barn in existence is 1810. There she stands. They're using it. It's not no more museum object. They're there. It's they got all the stuff hanging in there. And he says we've added on a couple of little places and we had to patch up the wood. But there it is. You know, great early American barn. I mean, the real thing, man. And I thought, you know, I just hope that uh, that someday somebody doesn't just level it, you know, and put in one of these great new Sears robot, clamp it together in aluminum barns, and forget it, because it is really a piece of Americana. So we went around the back, and he says, oh, he says, you like that kind of stuff? He said, uh, yeah. I said, yeah, I'm really interested. And and around the back, and, and there were a, a grove of trees around the back of the barn, just a bunch of trees, willows and uh, fir trees and stuff. Uh, there were there were a couple of old tractors back there. Now this is something that has to be seen to be believed. I couldn't believe it. They're standing in the weeds. Just weeds were six feet high around it. A steam tractor. 
Well, wait a minute. You're right, Barney. I don't know how many steam... I never never even saw one of these. Uh, you know, this is a... Uh, and it looks like a steam locomotive. It's got a pipe sticking out of the top of it with great, big, huge, fantastic iron wheels with uh, big cleats sticking out of them. You know, big, thin... They were kind of thin, but big, heavy wheels with, with these great, big uh, cleats, iron molded wheels, huge things. The wheels must have been six feet high on this thing. And, and uh, here it was standing back there in the woods. <laughs> said, Pat, that, well, he says, take a look at the other one. Well, I, I, he, I said, well, what, what, uh, where'd you get this? He said, well, it was here. This guy had been living on the farm himself uh, all of his life, and his father had lived there beforehand, and he says it was here during my father's time, and it was obviously here before he came here. It was during the, his grandfather's time. And he said, uh, it's just been out there. He said, uh, so there it is. And next to the thing, uh, in, in the same clump of weeds was another tractor standing there but this was a gasoline motor driven tractor and he says go on over and take a look at it well it had it had iron wheels again in the back it did not have rubber wheels or rubber tires or anything like that a big big iron wheels it was very high and he says go take a look at it and uh, I went back and looked at this tractor and the weeds there it was just standing there unrestored everything but the seat was still there. It had a big iron uh, triangular seat, you know, one of these seats, like a big bicycle seat where this guy would ride it. Had a great big flat wooden steering wheel, tremendous flat steering wheel, like a big truck steering wheel, and a long nose sticking out in front with half of the hood was raised up and was laying back and was kind of rusty, and you could see the engine in there. There's a gigantic six-cylinder engine in this thing with, with pistons about the size of buckets, see? <laughs> and, and, and it had a... It had a uh, uh, a radiator core on the front of it, see, with a radiator shell. So I walked around the front of this thing, and it looked like the front of an old car, see, so I walked around the front, and I took a look at it, and there on the radiator shell was the name of the car out of which this tractor had been built. And I said, well, when was this thing built? He says, well, my father built this tractor. He says he got this old, he got an engine on a car, and he says he built it back in the early 20s and it's still standing back there i said well, how long did he use it he said well he used it many many years he said he used it uh, for like uh, you know up through the 30s he used it like 20 years and 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 you know what the name of the car was that it was made out of had a had a big uh, insignia on the front of it a locomobile it said locomobile yeah <laughs> and i said gee that's fantastic and he said, well, he said, uh, it's back there. He says, uh, I said, well, what are you going to do with it? So I, I don't know. He said, uh, just back there. He said, I, I don't have any time to do anything with that, with that stuff. He says, I'm a farmer, you know. <laughs> he says, I'm not running a museum. And uh, he said, uh, it's just back there. And I thought to myself, boy, this stuff is, is really, in a way, it's priceless, you know. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's the coming of the machine to the farm, and uh, you know, which made an entirely different kind of world. It's the world that we're living in. Uh, speaking of museums, you know that one of the ironies of World War II is that uh, that museum that, uh, that I was telling you about, there are two museums of this kind. There's one in Munich and one in Berlin. Uh, great museums of technique where people go, if you're an engineer, and you go and you look at all these great pieces of equipment of the past and study them, and they're beautiful. They're all well laid out. Well, the one museum was hit by a bomb in World War II and destroyed in that bomb raid. That bomb came right through. was the last surviving airplane of Baron von Richthofen's World War I flying circus. The last one. It was on display in there. And it was a uh, triplane, a Fokker triplane, the only known last Fokker triplane to exist. Uh, it, you know, actually exist. There have been models made and there have been uh, replicas built. But this is the last actual Fokker triplane of the kind that the Baron, Red Baron, was killed in on the last days of his fantastic career. And they had one in that museum. It was one from that particular escadrille, or rather that, uh, that Jasta, uh, that he flew in. Well, during World War II, a bomb came right down through the roof and landed right on that airplane. <laughs> Isn't that a piece of irony? And uh, it was totally destroyed. 
in uh, in, a, in a raid. But uh, these things are being preserved in certain places. There's a fantastic museum, by the way, in uh, in Chicago. Have you ever been in the Chicago Museum of Mu Art and, and Industry? Oh man, that is a that is an exciting museum. Do you agree, Barney? That really is. That mine, yeah, they have a mine built in there, a coal mine, and it is scaringly real. Uh, you get into this coal mine, you go down into the mine, and uh, they, uh, how they've done it, I don't know. It's it's magic. Uh, you get the feeling like you're going down a thousand feet in the, into the earth, and the, the, it gets hotter and hotter. The temperature gets hot. You get down, and you're in this shaft of a coal mine, and they're mining coal down there, and they, they have these guys that are miners. Yeah, they actually are doing it down there, or at least you think they're doing it. And it's exactly like a visit to a coal mine. Beautiful display. And uh, I remember the first time I ever saw that, I was, I was in, a, in, a, in a Boy Scout troop, and they took us through that museum. And boy, I've never forgotten that museum. I go there, you know, my, I'm from Chicago, you know, and, and that museum was really great. You know, one of the things they've got in there, among other things, uh, hanging from the ceiling. You, you, you can't re really forget it if, uh, if you've been in that part of the museum. It's such a big museum, though, that you can go to that museum for a week and still see only one corner of it. <laughs> it's really something else. But right in one area there, they've got hanging from the ceiling one of the last surviving. It's a very rare exhibit uh, for anybody who's interested in aircraft. It's one of the very few surviving, absolutely mint condition, uh, original Stuka dive bombers. It's a Stuka, the famed uh, J.U. Junkers Stuka dive bomber. And there it is hanging from the ceiling with its original markings and the whole thing. The flaps are down. It's a wild looking thing. And they had the story of the day this plane was captured. It was apparently captured in North Africa. And uh, it was shipped back uh, in, in uh, mint condition. The plane had landed. Actually, the guy made a, made a bomb decision, the, the pilot. He, uh, he, in the middle of a sandstorm, apparently, he landed at the wrong airdrome. <laughs> Turned out to be a, an American airfield, and he came down at his Stuka. That was the end of the war for him. So they took the plane, and they brought it back. And here it is. It's hanging from the ceiling. Now, where can you see something like that? And by the way, they also have there, in that same museum, that's correct. They have one of the very few World War II German submarines ever captured intact. And it's right there in the museum, and you can go through it. And it is there, absolutely intact. It was captured down in the Caribbean, and it was sent up the Mississippi River. <laughs> they brought it up the Mississippi, and it was, uh, it was in the lake down there. Did you know that it was down there on, uh, near Navy Pier for a long time? And uh, they brought this baby in, and now it's in the museum. So this is the kind of museum, I think, that really knocks you out. Uh, among other things they've got there in that museum, which I, I always thought was fantastic, they have a cross-section of the Chicago city dump. Yes, it's, it's in a big glass case, and it's, it's been reconstructed, of course. You know, it's a cross-section. It's as if you were looking at the city dump, and way down at the bottom of the dump, you can see the earliest shards of the early settlers, like arrowheads, uh, pieces of fur cap, and all that stuff. Yeah, that was Fort Dearborn. All the way on up to the top, you know, then you start to hit things like, uh, like pop bottles and beer cans and stuff, you know, as the changing tides go. And I thought, you know, that's a fantastic museum. But the sound, give me, a little, give me one more little sound of that little locomotive. Just sneak it in there. Just, to, yeah, that's right. Theme, everything all at once. Come on, bring that sound up there. <laughs> oh, the sound of the general chugging away through the... Yeah, the flags flying, the people cheering, and the bands playing. Hooray! Yeah, in the freight yard? Oh, I hear it. Look away. What's that, Barney? Yeah, this is the return from the big trip. Bring up that beat. Man, one day we'll all be in a museum. All of us. I must wolf man everybody. All preserved for posterity. Hi, <laughs> posterity. How the hell do you like it up there, eh?
Have you ever one of those people always tend to think that posterity is lucky? To be posterity? Well, let's face it, friends, we're somebody else's posterity. You know? So bring it up there. These things, this gets so complicated, it's very difficult to think in these terms. Right, Barney? Right, let's bring it up. <laughs> what they ought to preserve is a genuine yellow cab from New York, you know, with the cigar butts, the whole bit, you know. Just as it as it was stopped on 6th Avenue and 34th Street and sealed in plastic, with the passenger in it and everything, you know. The angry cab driver, you know, wearing his uh, New York Jets t-shirt, the whole bit. Yeah, that radio you're listening to me with right now, you know. You better hang on to that. A hundred years from now, that's going to be worth maybe fifteen, twenty dollars. Just hang on. W O R New York. Next, John Wingate and Night Beat. Under the new astrology oin, I'll give you my birth date, not year, January 16th. Am I a Capricorn? No, sir, you are a Sagittarian, according to the real stars. That places me then along with Mayor Lindsay, Dr. Margaret Mead, Frank Sinatra, and Joe DiMaggio. And, but, some, and someone named Richard Nixon. But then they wouldn't be Sagittarians, would they? Well, if yours, you are taking with you the old Capricornians into the true Sagittarius. On Night Beat, the new astrology. Look, we have the new math. Why not the new astrology? And by the way, good morning. <laughs>